Happy Monday, everybody. Yo! Sorry, oh. I'm finishing an email. There we go. Someone in the chat said, uh, am I playing Doom? It did, it did seem to sound a little like Doom music. Does it sound doomy? Doomy, yeah. but not gloomy. That's a new Monster Cat Mercenary by F-O-O-L and Power Club. Oh. Hello, everybody. Yo! Is it uh, just the three of us, or do we have an Andrew Main showing up? Uh, hopefully he will join us soon. I know that he sometimes mentions he has meetings and things, so I don't... Um, I don't quite know. Let me let me give him a text and see what's up. There he is. Oh, there he is. That's that's the man we love. Yeah, to see. remember that text I said Mondays are going to be crazy from here on to eternity. Mondays are going to be crazy from here into eternity. Ah, uh, gotcha. I didn't realize. For me. Uh, yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah. No. Sorry. Yeah, I should have been more. But yeah, that is a. I have. You see, Brian, when you're part of an organization with people and responsibilities, a lot of things going on. No, that's good. You're good, man. Uh, hello, everybody. Oh, I, no, I, I'm just <laughs> beginning to understand what your world is like. I'm just beginning to understand what... Uh... When, when the whole world is, is grabbing at you? Yeah, you, you have meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Meetings, meetings, man. <laughs> what even? What's up with that? Hello. Everybody. Yeah, just have like, like, I, like I okay. have a state of like eleven thirty, uh, my time thing, which. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I know that that, yeah. that that's been the past couple of weeks, and we hadn't quite got a sense of, um, what that looks like, realistic or in real life, IRL. Yeah, I might say. Yeah. Um. Hello, everybody. It's October 19, 2020. We're going to start weird things here in just a few moments. How's everybody doing? Is anybody yeah. good? <laughs> Is anybody? Is anybody, anybody good? Is anybody I'm out there? Of us? <laughs> uh, a bunch of people in the chat got fooled. Okay. Okay. They're accusing <laughs> me of having gotten a haircut. That's not the case, my friends. Oh. Look at that. Wait, wait, uh, wait, wait, wait. Well, there it is. Yeah, I've got it pulled back. That's fine. I'm almost getting to that length. Yeah, like um, that. like uh, uh, what I'm doing right now is I'm sort of I'm styling it as if it's pulled back from my head, and then spraying it and letting it air dry, and then uh, and then when it dries, it falls not in my face, hmm. uh, and it also dries super straight. And in the meantime, I look like I'm a banker in uh, in a uh, 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 in the HUD sucker proxy. <laughs> I think if you if you. If you just shave down to the mustache, you'd almost have like a dangle look, like a Jim Dangle, a uh, dangle look. A dang dangle? What? What? What, what is From, that? Uh, Reno nine one one. Oh, got it, Lieutenant. You dangle. need the hot yeah, pants. Yeah, yeah, got it. Yeah, the hot pants. <laughs> uh, Justin, you have a good weekend. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, it was um, it was good. Made some progress on things. Um, love to make progress on things. Yeah, I, I, I screwed up uploading two podcasts, which was great for a 72 hour uh, period of time. I uploaded the wrong one the first time. And then Squarespace has this fun trick of uh, showing a full loading bar, which you think means that your file has uploaded, which always takes forever with them for some reason. Uh, but it's not. It means that it has not turn to the file name which is how you actually know that it's been uploaded and so i uploaded the final episode of raise the dead last night oh, and no. then this morning they're like hey guys hey it hasn't showed up in any of the oh no odd catchers and i'm like oh so i looked at the file or at the post and it definitely did not have a file on it the good news is that there actually was a newer version of the podcast that i i was able to upload when I figured that out. So that's good. That's cool. Aha. Yeah. Uploading podcasts is always weird. If we, if, if, if we mess up, if I mess up with uploading something, um, you know, ideally you would just be able to replace the file or fix, update the post and people would just get it. It would just ripple out. And a lot of podcast play players don't do that. In fact, Google play podcasts very specifically doesn't, they will cache yeah. a file on their side and never update it. Um, 
So you have to delete it and then you have to make sure all the post stuff is different. Like there's a different slug and there's a different um, uh, post. So it looks like a new post that just happens to be. Um, very weird, man. Podcasts. Yeah. Odd. Odd. Uh, how are you doing, Andrew? Good, good, good. One of these, you know, juggling acts sort of things <laughs> of like trying to, you know, it's, it's, you know, as, and I have it put on my Twitter, but, um, uh, working with open eye has been wonderful. It's been great, but it's also like, I'm finding more areas I can contribute, which is great, but it also means more areas I'm contributing. So it's yeah. like, I had a simple life. I was a simple man. Once. Yeah. Uh, like I just saw, was it one of the, uh, uh, new CNN analyst, New Yorker contributor accidentally, or we don't quite know the circumstances flashed a bit of his genitalia on a zoom call. I saw that they let him go. And right. Wait, it was, well, he's, he's suspended. Well, we don't know. Number one, it was at the, surely erotic and sexually charged group zoom meeting between the new yorker and wnyc uh so so obviously you know that stuff Wait, was going down I, I know that name jeffrey tubin what do i know that from he is cnn's chief legal analyst oh, and he also wrote he he wrote the book that the people versus oj simpson was got based it. on the, the dramatized version oh um but yeah he apparently uh, uh pulled his hose out on a zoom camera or his hose was showing and we don't really have any uh information on it other than he has been suspended indefinitely from the new yorker i believed i was not visible on zoom i thought no one on the zoom call could see me i thought i had muted the zoom video <laughs> oof that's i mean that that sounds legit to me <laughs> it's, it's it's certainly well, one of my perpetual fears of of not knowing if a click is like is is a circle around it on or off yeah that's a that's a major concern because like do i click does the microphone without the slash mean i can be heard or does that mean to unslash it right right and also here's, is it grayed out versus bolded like which one is which mm -hmm. here's my thought though if this is a bit of the a bit of the the you know a frank or a bean pokes its way out because you didn't put pants on and you stand up i don't know if you get suspended for that I think that's embarrassment. That's maybe a talking to suspension is. I kind of feel like there needs to be intentionality to, to a suspension for something like that. I don't know. I could see a situation where he genuinely didn't think that his camera was on. And as a result was just full back, you know, man spreading totally naked. You know, he's like, well, I, I didn't think the camera was on. Like, I mean, like when you think the camera's off, there's a different way you carry yourself that if the camera's on could read as I'm into this. Yeah, I guess I would almost take somebody being into that as more likely than accidentally having the camera off. Oh, like, disagree. I've had the camera on too many times to, to feel like I've never, I've never man spread it and been into it. <laughs> but I've definitely I mean, had things be muted or not muted when I thought they were the reverse. Yeah. I guess that's the case. I just sort of treat this zone like, I don't think I'm going to intentionally ever do anything in front of here, regardless of where the, my cameras, my computer could not even be here. And I'm just, just paranoid of like, you know, <laughs> walking in in my underwear. And it's like, I, I mean, just... yeah, I guess, I guess maybe look, I, I I mean, the maybe, fact that this s has trickled me, out. The fact that this has trickled out. <laughs> sell me on the other side of this. Like he's he's into uh, peekaboo. Oh, no, and he's a powerful of, uh, of NPR. Oh, <laughs> spoiler alert: uh, a powerful New York media tycoon uh, wants to impose his uh, uh, power and and does so through inappropriate sexual means. Like I don't, I don't, I think that 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 is a story we have heard a million different times and Tubin certainly would be somebody that could carry that kind of gravitas. Hmm. Huh. He he's, was, he's like a lawyer, right? A legal he's a television analyst. Right. Lawyer. So he would choose yeah. to display his power in a well-known recordable format mm -hmm. to a well, bunch of liberal like, NPR folks. <laughs> yeah. 
we, uh, we had a uh, in the accidental one of the Avengers accidentally. Uh, yeah, Chris Evans. Chris Evans owned it picks. though, like a boss. Uh, was, America's. I wasn't going to say his name to sort of let it live down. Uh, uh, but yeah, he, he apparently um, is not interested in letting it live down. <laughs> He's like, "Yep, that's uh, my wanger." Oh, I, <laughs> I, I, I take a different take on that, but okay. Um, but yeah, um, it's a scary age we live in. <laughs> Just yeah, I guess my, my my only thought on it is that I'm more judging, trying to piece together the story based on what we got. So Vice hears that he's suspended and Vice chases this down and gets the quote from Tubin, uh, which means that somebody heard a story from the New Yorker or WNYC who were on that call. Um, like, uh, uh, I, I think that they, that story is likely what causes that reporting, uh, which makes me think the story is more intentional, but you never know. Hmm. Well, fine. Uh, don't worry. I'm sure we'll figure it all out. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure we'll be able to see it in HD. Um, <laughs> Oh. I mean, oh. <laughs> okay. Wow. Um, all right. How you? How are y'all feeling? How, <laughs> what does HD stand for again? Good until now. <laughs> yeah. Good lord. Hog. Oh, hog no. definition, me, of course. Hog definition. Uh, <laughs> hold on. Let me get uh, more coffee, and then I'll sure. be ready to go. <laughs> Hello, everybody. We're gonna start weird things in just a minute. Uh. uh uh, so, a little baseball update. I've not, I've not been keeping up with Ooh. baseball in the past couple of weeks, or I've been, I've been aware of things that have been going on, but I haven't done my usual betting and stuff. Apparently, they have new in, invoked new rules this season, where uh, if you are ahead by ten points, they will give you a win, reset the scoreboard, and you will continue playing the game. <laughs> so they are three games in, and already. The unlimited tacos are three and two. <laughs> you already have three wins and two losses after three games. Uh, the the sh the the aura of baseball has extended all the way to my sixteen year old daughter. Oh, really? Uh, Penny Penny's like thinking of getting into it because I guess one of the backstories behind one of the teams involves some lore of one of the properties she's interested in, and and so it's like oh, interesting. Like it, it's it's funny where a sixteen year old. <laughs> Like, yeah, I know you talked about this months ago, but I don't know. I'm starting to think it's kind of cool, maybe. <laughs> <You> know, like, <laughs> <laughs> they have to, like, they have to establish this separate. It's not cool because you said right, right. it for other reason. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, and then one of the teams um, ascended, um, which I think is when you win the playoffs three times, maybe in a row. Um, and so I believe the crabs are no longer in the game and they have been replaced with the Tokyo lift. Their motto is we've got swole. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, they're one and two so far. So baseball update. Here's right the danger of baseball is like several hundred years ago, some drunk dudes walked out of a pub with like their walking sticks and somebody found a very round rock and they're in Scotland and they're like, let's try to hit it in that hole over there. <laughs> and then, and then it became a game we call golf today. Yeah. And it started as a joke. I mean, so, <laughs> so, so did crop circles. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Um, I would love to see a physical manifestation of baseball just to see who would be the giant squid. I just can't wait mm -hmm. for the weather to be a total solar eclipse. We can take a look at that. I mean, that'd be a hell of a con. A, a baseball con? And you could uh, uh, have some kind of representation or just a gathering of fans? Like, that'd be dope. Oh, yeah. it took me a second to realize you meant convention. Not, not a heist? like a scam, a swindle. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, no, Like, no. what's the big? <laughs> they can do it. They uh, can no, do yeah, it no, on a, great, a big a great baseball convention. Diamond. Oh, hell yeah. No, go to some uh, minor league park. I'm sure they would be awesome. They would probably rename the team. The official, you know, team they'd rename it one of the uh, one of the baseball team names, but that'd be really fun. Yeah. All right, you guys uh, ready to do weird things? Ready. Yep. Yep. All right, then I'm gonna count you in in three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. Justin Robert Young. 
Hello, friends. How are you? And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me speaking. So we had another sighting here in L.A. of Mr. Jetpack. Oh, wait. Uh, you- uh, now, now, now we have we have a few jetpacks. Uh, this isn't the uh, uh, the 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 rescue ranger jetpack guy, right? This is this is this. This is the Rocketeer. This is an airplane up at altitude that says, hey, yeah, we see a guy on a jetpack. <laughs> at the air at LAX. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So this is the planes are reporting the fact that there is a guy with a jetpack flying around and we have seen yet another sighting of this. <laughs> yeah. And this is like, this is how a Marvel movie begins. Yeah, quite literally. I believe that's a scene in the first Iron Man movie yeah. <laughs> that that the uh, like the F-16s or whatever don't know what they're looking at. Like, it looks like a guy. And we're assuming it's a jetpack. I mean, what if it's a dude that can fly with a backpack? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Who's got who's got who's got some bruise in the back? <laughs> he's, he's like, hey, man, it's a six hour journey. <laughs> So we're making some assumptions here, everybody. Media hasn't proven conclusively that it is a jetpack that is making this man fly. So we can just say flying man and cover all bases, or flying person. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I guess. Uh, I guess. I guess I'm okay with it. More the more the merrier. I mean, you know, you do you, whoever you are with the jetpack. Or Six thousand feet in the air. Good God, yeah. that's very the- high in the air. I mean, at the very least, I get that high. My backpack is going to have a parachute in it. And, and just like in the movies, there's now an FBI command center in some hangar where they're trying to track down the mysterious flying man, you know, and they got radar and stuff. Here, it's like sitting on some guy's desk, like, huh, another one. <laughs> Anyhow, I mean, for lunch. <laughs> I mean, like, as long as he's not uh, shooting at planes, that's fine by me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you I just, would presume that this should, this should uh, uh, be something that is high priority, right? Because let, let's say he is like, let's say he does blow up a a plane from a foreign country. Like now, that's an international incident, right? Yeah, when he's up there with this got a shotgun, you know, <laughs> like now, I I. If 2020 wasn't already so damn weird, this would be a big news. There'd be a task force there. But here we're like, yeah, of course. Oh, tentacle monster in Hudson Bay? Sure. Why not? You know, giant squid found in a swimming pool? Okay, cool. What else? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, <laughs> to the future, it's it's as weird as we feared <laughs> slash hoped. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess it, it, it's... It, it, I... I I can't imagine that this is a problem that's going to go away. Like, yes, this guy has a jetpack. Like, there does not need to be some level of, like, enforcement of, like, all right, we're just going to get people with a bunch of other ideas on how they're going to propel themselves up into, you know, our our uh, plane landing areas, and then that eventually it's going to be a major problem, right? Uh, so I have... I, I, I would imagine that you know, part as part of Moore's law, we're going to have AI and, and and stuff that makes them literally idiot proof where everybody will have their own bubble and nobody can invade somebody else's personal space. And you'll, you'll probably have idiots like trying to race towards each other, trying to bounce off of each other as the AI algorithms, you know, keep them at least 300 yards apart or whatever. Why? Well, yeah. That would be a best case is then it's sort of just easy to use it, but I have suspects for you. Oh, got it. Let's uh, go. Uh, List uh, them off. List them off. Okay. Well, here, no, like I got legit. I got a lineup for you, like a real go. legit lineup for go. you. Okay. okay. Uh, Let's uh, go. Uh, uh, first two have to be Elon Musk and uh, no, no. Uh, Jeff Bezos. And no, no, like I, I literally, literally have suspects for you. I okay. literally have actual people who, um, digging turns out that there is a company in Southern California which has jetpacks. And they also offer like a jetpack school, which, uh, by the way, Brian, I think you need to do. And I want you to take a look at these. These are the people at Jetpack Aviation. You're looking at a video now of some of our suspects who have access to. And then when we go after we're done with this, I want to show you go to the main page. There's a photo there of a lineup. And I want you to take a look and see who you think. But here we're looking at uh, David Mamian, founder, chief pilot. 
<laughs> so, so <laughs> you know? these jetpacks are the traditional like like they're they're shooting out just blasts of air essentially or or i guess they're really no, they're they're turbines. Truly... those are gas turbines okay those are gas it. turbines okay man how long how long do you get in these I believe it. You can get a one or two day course. Oh, sorry. I mean, I mean, how long in the air before you run out of fuel? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, like fifteen minutes or so, I think. So the way they do this, the way they train you is they actually have this tethered system. So you you strap this on modern rogue, and what you do is you start this thing up and you start to hover modern rogue, and you're able to sort of float around this course in a safe way, which modern rogue. Um, <laughs> that is pretty amazing. So, so the idea is this this video yeah, is well, over a year old too and it only has 33,000 views. It's a school where you learn to fly a jetpack. Yeah. I, all right. All right. So so or go to the wait, go to the page. Go to Bryce, go to the page. I want to show you there's a lineup here. Scroll down just a little bit. Stop right there. Uh just go down so we can see their faces. It does yeah, look it's like uh, oh, it's got to be that dude in the middle who's mugging for the camera, yes. right? <laughs> <laughs> hey Wally, where was the jetpack last night? <laughs> That's amazing. Um, what are the odds that it's going to be one of these people? A hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, if they're, if they're Vegas the isn't even taking action. And, yeah, and, do we and know I where wonder... it is? Wait, 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 wait. Do do we have a do we have an address for this? Can we chart it to LAX? Because that that's what I'm curious. Like, like are they taking uh are are they are they taking a, a car down to like someplace around where LAX is? Are they right by LAX to the point where they could like is this a new model that they're like testing? I, I also would imagine that it's roughly I mean, you're allowed to fly a hang glider without telling nobody and you could ride thermals up really high or do paragliding or any of that stuff. So I, I'd imagine, you know, you you don't have to call the airports and say, watch out. I'm going to look cooler than those other guys flying in the same airspace. I'm pretty sure you do. Pretty really? sure you do. <laughs> yes. Wow. Uh, huh. Per for, their, I think, you I think have for, airspace. You can't fly yeah. a drone above 100 feet. Uh, yeah, but but I mean, I, I've i flown on a hang glider above 100 feet. Uh, Where? In, in L.A., like over the city of LA oh, well, or where? I mean, I mean, over houses and, and whatnot. It, it, it uh, uh, and, and, and in the hang gliding club, uh, local legend was about a dude who rode the thermals from like Northwest LA to all the way down to um, uh, Palm, Palm Springs. I think he, he made it down. It was like an all day trip or something. Um, but you know, maybe he was violating airspace laws the whole way through, but, uh, well, but I was under the impression that, uh, that, uh, I mean, maybe 6,000 feet was above whatever hard deck or whatever. And certainly being in the airspace of an airport is, is bad news. You're not allowed to do that. Uh, per their FAQ, uh, their experience center is in Moore Park, California, one hour's drive north of LAX airport. Which is maybe <laughs> how, you know, how do they answer the FAQ of is it safe? <laughs> Do, do they do any wiggle room in that? Uh, is it safe? We do everything we can to ensure the pilot safety, including be attached at all times to the tether system. We did see that in the video. They have a tether. Uh, and a special apparel designed for jetpack operators, reducing the chance of burns. Reducing the chance. Of reducing the chance of burns. By the way, now I know to add burns to my list of concerns about flying a jetpack. But apparently insurance does come with the uh, cost of doing this thing. Well, my next of kin will appreciate that. <laughs> And lunch and drinks are included. Ooh. Nice. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I love I love uh, this. It is re this is big bold H one text. <laughs> it is really safe, all caps. So please don't worry about that. Period. We have st spent years <laughs> refining the operation, and you will always be on a safety cable and have an instructor that can take control at any time. Man, can we just put out a universal <laughs> memorandum that says if you feel the need to type in all caps to emphasize how legit you are, don't. It's like, really like safe. Zero percent yeah. of the time do I see all caps and think, well, that must be true because it's in all caps. I yeah I, Brian walks in sets up they put the pack on him Jason's got the camera Bryce has got a camera Brian pulls out the wire cutters <laughs> so long, <suckers>. yeah. <laughs> wow
Yeah, I would uh, imagine when computer aided guidance gets better and better, I, I, I do like all of a sudden I believe like what? Well, I'm, I'm halfway through this crazy ride if I live to be 90. Uh, I guess in my lifetime, I could see an idiot proof version of this being available. Yeah, so to do this, it's it's five thousand dollars to go to the school. And man, I just I'm sorry, but I'm like, I'm thinking like they're like, uh, we don't have any clients today. We got nobody. We need to drum up business. Wally, hint, hint, we're going to go for lunch. <laughs> got it. Got I mean, because even because even if they're an hour away. The question is like where a, exactly you put it in, in the back of a truck? It's a jetpack. You don't oh, sure. I would not fly from there. Yeah, whatever. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it although if you wanted to grab attention, it seems like you'd dress in a clown costume or or a political, you know, hold a political sign or something. Like I, I do get the vibe that it sounds like somebody's just out there minding their own business, flying around in a jetpack, according to what we've heard so far. Uh, Bryce, do you want to show them the other stuff they have? Their, uh, their military speeders. Uh, they, have, Oh, uh, do they? I, I actually don't. Let me see. Click Those on are... our V2L, the, the gears, our V2L company. Oh, gotcha. Here we go. Once you've Scroll tasted down. flight, you will forever walk the earth with your eyes turned skyward, <laughs> for there you have been, and there you will always long to return. Leonardo that doesn't da Vinci. sound very safe. So they, oh my gosh, they've got jetpack, or they've got speeders. Man, I feel like we've talked about these speeders or something like them before. Something like them, yeah. Yeah. No, we were talking about the ones that would be able to go... Uh, they were like mountainous regions and stuff like that, but they were fairly short range. Yeah. These are flying I, I, motorcycles. I, I feel much safer on a flying motorcycle, weirdly. Number one, more fuel. Number two... Uh, How fast would you drive your uh, wireless motorcycle? Uh, click click the link. Click the link on the... Uh... Okay. We'll see if we can find the link on there. Uh, man, I, I, I guess my... my my comfort would be directly proportionate to the amount that I knew computers were doing the heavy lifting on everything. So it says 150 miles an hour max speed. That seems, that seems about right. That's a, uh, that's, that's insane. That's what half the, half the speed of uh, a propeller aircraft can do like 300, right? Yeah. 30 minutes flight time. That's, that's, that's better than right. I think the one that we were, that we were looking at. I think that when we were looking at was 15. Yeah, holy cow. Yeah, uh, I, I'm into it. It's a jet ski for the sky. I, I don't know where I would go. I, I don't think they would allow me to go downtown. Well, and that's the only place yeah, I would go. No, but that's that's what it would be. Like, we are looking at a different version of what super rich people use, like, helicopters for, right? So it's like, uh, you know, when people are going from, like, other parts of LA to downtown LA or uh, from Manhattan to the Hamptons, stuff so, like so that. So maybe a 20 mile commute that would normally be an hour and change with traffic suddenly becomes a, a 10 minute roller coaster ride. I don't yes. think this is going to be used as a commuter vehicle, but like, unless you're Brian and like, I can, I just see these poor people at Chick-fil-A as they open up the drive through <laughs> window and the wind, the wind is blowing napkins and everything all around this. Oh God, Brian's here. That's hilarious. And, 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 and every single time they make me give my name as if I've never been there every single day. I'm exactly. the guy yeah. on the jet Fine. cycle. It's always you go, me. You have to do like these strafing runs through the drive. Brian. <laughs> Brushwood. <laughs> Order four. Can't, 63. Can't stop. Aerodynamics. <laughs> Extra sauce. I have a chicken sandwich for a lot of wind. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. So, uh, Stoics Girl br brings up the fact that people complain about e bikes, electronically powered bikes that go 20 to 30 miles per hour. I believe they're restricted legally to. 20 miles an hour unless you cheat and switch it to kilometers per hour in which case you get like a couple miles an hour or more but beyond that they become like electronic motorbikes which enter a different legal uh threshold 
Um, at least on that, how fast they can go. Right, exactly. Like now, all of a sudden, it's no longer a bicycle that's goosed by electronics. It becomes a motorcycle that is very slow, and, oh, yeah, and that yeah. changes the rules. There's a price on here. Oh, wait, for, if, wait. They're actually selling these. Well, well, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, accepting money and selling, while ostensibly the same thing, are not necessarily yeah. the same thing. <laughs> uh. So guess care to guess the price? Uh, um, this looks like a half mil. I mean, I'm mm. gonna say they're gonna say it's a half mil, and they're gonna act like it's a half mil, but those first units are going for over a million for sure. Anybody else? Anybody? Uh, yeah, no, I, I'll, I'll second that. Uh, I'd, I'd go. Th you said five hundred thousand. I would probably go three hundred thousand. Survey oh, says $380,000 is what they're saying the price would be. This is as of 2018. So oh. we don't know. Uh, that's, uh, that seems remarkably cheap. I guess I don't know how much fuel, because it's, it's not electric, right? You would need to gas it? You probably need uh, uh, kerosene, uh, aviation, um, jet fuel. Diesel or kerosene. Oh, so I could take this to the, I could take this to the Valero, get the diesel. God, would that be great? <laughs> <laughs> you just go swoop it in, you fly down, <laughs> put it in, get yourself some some nerds and some Twizzlers, <laughs> and then fly yeah. off. I'm a number, uh, I'm at this, I'm at this with a wireless hel helicopter over there. <laughs> I just like the idea that you'd have the car alarm beep, like as you walk in, like beep, beep. We have a video of the Jetpack Aviation, you know, meaning like computer generated video. Of oh, got it. This. Like, uh, let me send this to Bryce. This, this, uh, this is the crazy bi bike one. Yeah, and I, I take, I apologize. I said it's not for commute, but they show some, so show some dude yeah, just I'm, flying I'm over like. I'm almost this is the video that we watched. It must have been a year ago or so. Yeah, I, I do. Yeah, I think we remember the same, the same think company that... from a different vector. I think originally we were entranced by the by the the flying bike, and now now we've got the jetpack vector that leads us to the same place. Oh uh, yeah, they're showing this in wow through buildings. Yeah, that's in the downtown happening. space, and then going. I love the idea because he's like kind of dressed up in this big Marvel flying suit, this kind of like Ant Man suit. <laughs> And then Brian, stepping for that into like the gym. Brian, you say confidently it's not gonna happen, but what if I said Tom Cruise bought the first one? Uh okay, well, I mean that dude does what he wants. <laughs> no. I don't that, know did, that, that dude that dude but... obeys intergalactic law and, and and has a statute of limitations of trillions of years. <laughs> There's a second one in this video <laughs> that is like yeah, that, storage, that's the cargo clearly. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think we talked about like like that's where you pack your lunch and it comes and delivers yeah. it to you. But it looks like a hearse. It, it looks it does, like it's it got looks a like it's carrying. <laughs> it does. It's oh, got yeah. a, it's got a coffin right <laughs> built in. <sighs> that's so funny. Yeah, that's that nuts. Uh, uh, Mirovina in the chat brings up the noise factor, and I believe that was one of the biggest problems with the perennial uh, flying car, Mahler space car, or, or flying car. Um, like all the way back into the 60s, Mahler has been trying to do jet-powered cars, but ultimately noise ordinances are just a deal killer. And that, that and the, um, uh, the ability to get government institutions to institute basically lanes for highways in the sky of where you're allowed to go to, to fly around cities and all that stuff. Well, we'll, we'll see what's going to happen. Like, yeah, I agree. Like, that's the thing that, you know, the the whole everybody have a flying car thing kind of falls apart when you think of how loud is one drone but there can be cases and you know that's what uber and it's hard to know if it's just more of a pr thing because they didn't want to put all the money into like self-driving anymore or not but uber uber has that big push towards the you know electric flight yeah we talked about that it was like a hex copter that was big enough to fit one person and it would just jump right across the bay from san francisco to san jose or whatever yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, which I mean, but it would the the idea there being that you would use m the majority of the flight over the water, so you weren't flying over people and it, where you weren't annoying people. Well, uh, not the the Uber a lot of city that wasn't, stuff. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, maybe maybe I I'm, I'm misremembering, but 
uh, uh, I, th I think that one story, Justin, I, I remember that as well, but, but now I'm seeing it looks like a more recent article where it's got more plain looking stuff with uh, propellers. Yeah, this may be different than because I also remember the San Francisco one. This may be slightly different. Um, hmm. So, so okay, if we're voting for let's 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 kind of rank um, in terms of our personal excitement. Uh, we'll throw jetpack in there. We'll throw sky cycle in there. We'll throw Uber hexcopters uh, or or, or uh, electric puddle jumpers, uh, and we'll throw. Fully autonomous driving in there. That's the slowest, but the closest uh, and most accessible. Theoretically, the less catastrophic if you get in a wreck. What else What else should we put in the bin before we rank them? I guess, I guess that's, that's sort good. of the limit of what's realistic, right? Yeah, yeah, right? I mean, uh, oh, I guess Hyperloop, making... Hyperloop uh, bullet trains or whatever. That's, that's at the bottom for me because that just seems... I mean, we already have high-speed rail and... And I already don't like that. And that's a real thing that exists right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that I think that a jetpack thing sounds the coolest in that you just imagine you're flying free. Sounds like a big pain in the butt to me and it's going to mess up my hair. Same with a uh, sky cycle. Maybe, maybe, maybe uh, the, the Uber thing might be at the top. If there's a flying Uber car. And then second would be an autonomous vehicle. Third would be a, a sky bike. Fourth would be a jetpack, and fifth would be a high-speed magic rail. Well, I, Wait, I, say I that again. Yeah. Wait, what was your? I'm sorry. Uh, what was your order again? Uh, my order. My order was the Uber uh, puddle jumping electric skyhopper because I feel like I could get in wearing a suit and having my hair done and land still with an unruffled suit and my hair done for a fancy meeting. Uh, below that would be an autonomous, fully autonomous vehicle where I'm reading the Wall Street Journal the whole time. Then below that would be a sky cycle. Then below that would be the jetpack, and then below that would be the high speed, some kind of hyperloop or high speed rail thing. Man, future Dude. Brian's very fancy. Yes, well, yeah, future, you, future Brian's you, got he's got important meetings and he's got, he's reading the journal. Like, yeah, that's the only yeah. reason. I, that's the only reason I could think of that idea. I mean, otherwise, I'm driving the Jeep if I don't give it up. So, so this is this is the one you're most excited about, the order of excitement or likelihood. Um, yeah, or 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 just just in terms of 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 wantiness and for lack of a better word, um, like like those the, that's the one that that that. If, if I was like, gimme, uh, that's the one I'm most gimme on. Like, uh, you could tell me that all five of these exist today, and the one that I would get on first would be an Uber, Uber flying taxi. Mm -hmm. What about you guys? Uh, oh, I would take the jetpack first. That, that would be the best. Like, uh, A, it's about as functional as anything else, like in terms of, uh, you owning a thing and then having to do something with it. But it's like, I can think of a ton of times where I just need to like, meh, jetpack uh, a <laughs> couple blocks over here. And then, you know, just go to jetpack over there. Like if I'm going to a friend's place, I, I, I could just jetpack. So that that's number one. Number two, I would say, ah, I mean, it, it, it's hard because you have to put this in a situation where these are all applied at their best. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, which means I would kind of think the best applied version of a hyperloop would be something that would be very, 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 uh, uh, very helpful. Like being able to get back and forth to LA in, you know, a fraction of the time would put me in LA. It would make LA just a part of my life more than it would otherwise. And that's probably going to effectively change my life a little bit more than being able to to uh, uh, jetpack to the Wendy's, which is what my imagination is for that. So I put that second. Third, uh, I would say the speeder, just because it's kind of like the jetpack thing, but a little bit bulkier. And then autonomous cars, eh, we, mo we mostly have it now, boring. Yeah, the rail, I, I totally agree with your justification, but... Just I think of when I think of any kind of hyperloop or rail, I just think other people, and <laughs> that, that 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 sort of dampens everything for me. Which is weird because I'm down with uh, flying everywhere, and I don't mind that. But there's sort of this this code of everybody pretending that nobody else is on the plane. Well, remember too, part of that is it's so fast. It's not like 
airplane flight wait length time, it'd be faster in theory and best implementation. Yeah. And, and the thing that excites me, like if you said, oh, if I woke up tomorrow, what I what do I think would be the best for everybody? Like if you had, if you could get you know, legit, like it's gonna get, everybody understand, we understand all the complications and a lot more. But if we woke up tomorrow, like, yeah, no, we got this tunneling system, we can build it cheap, we figured this out, we can build these loops. Think about like, we live where we live because often, you know, we want to be because of work or opportunity, et cetera. And if you could, like Justin said, like, oh, if, like, if I could, if I could hyperloop between here and, you know, San Francisco and Oakland, like, like that makes like, you know, my current job would, uh, would make it a lot easier. If all of a sudden you could build suburbs in Nevada, you know, across the county line and be able to live and work in LA or travel places. When you take all this, all these places that are like, there's nothing there for another reason that it's just, it's not near anywhere, but you can all of a sudden connect it with a hundred miles of loop. You can create entire new kinds of cities, entire new opportunities and stuff. Do, do you think there ever gets to be in a, a level of efficiency with a hyperloop that you could do nutty things like, like, I guess you could. You could just set up a tanker of, I mean, people already drive semis filled with water to deliver to remote locations where it doesn't make sense to drill a well. So you could, you could just in the middle of the desert, have your place, just get, you know, uh, 10,000 gallons of water delivered every few weeks and- Or, uh, build, yeah, or build a pipeline from someplace that has an aquifer and not a lot of people or build it where there's aquifers. Or what. I mean, yeah, there's, there's like, yeah, I think that, you absolutely, it becomes so much because when you have the ability to move people and things long distances for very, very inexpensive, you know, we, the reason California exists the way it does today is because of rail. Without the railway, wouldn't be the way it is. Once you had rail and you could just lay tracks between the East Coast and the West Coast, you look at what it was like before rail right. and like, you know, the Oregon Trail nightmare. Once you put rail, Step change, West Coast. You know, there's a great book which I maybe put that as my pick about called Astoria, which was about the plan to try to develop a separate country on the West Coast, kind of like you know a sibling in the United States. You know, and that you know the idea of and this was the thing, the way they sort of thought about things before you had railway, you know, effective you know rail because like they're so you had mountains and you had seas and all these things that pulled you apart. You Very know, cool. For, 40 years later, kind of the 50, 60, the world started to change the way we looked at things. Yeah, I guess, so. um, uh, I guess what I'm wrestling with, with, with my, with my top five in order is, uh, you and I have talked about, uh, Rory Sutherland's book, uh, Alchemy, where it's like, uh, distance becomes time, but mm -hmm. how you spend your time is different in a jetpack. You're not also playing Pokemon go, uh, or, uh, yeah. although in a, in a Uber, uh, uh, magical hex copter you might. Um, yeah, I, I would put like, like if, if Hyperloop is the way it's envisioned was there, I put it there. Then the next one is, is your, is your copter. Cause I see getting downtown, whatever, like I would love to walk across the heliport and have an Uber come pick us up and take us fly us somewhere, you know, 50 miles North, whatever. And I think that is a, I think that opens up some of the opportunities in a way that like Hyperloop would, you know, the problem is, is it, Hyperloop allows you to have far more people going back and forth faster, but even and I guess I guess also they're they're solving two different problems. Uh, the hexcopter Uber thing would be that last mile journey where where there's a lot of twists and turns and parking is scarce or whatever. Whereas whereas city to city Hyperloop is is going to be you know well a, a literal yeah. And I, I, when I brought this up before, and it was just you know you know when when Kobe Bryant and everybody else. Um, lost their life on the on the helicopter crash. That was a regular commute, like between LAX and this place called Calabasas, which is far to the north of LA. But you can have nice big mansions there and have big space there. There are people who make that commute, real wealthy people, straight if they got to work in downtown LA or whatever. But they can go hop on a helicopter, fly over two hours of traffic, and be home. The world is very different for you when you can get from point A to point B faster. Right. Yeah, we, uh, as, as is evidenced by the fact that, that I spent like three months in L.A. and we never saw each other because we were 10 yeah. whole miles apart in L.A. Yeah, it's. 
No, that's for real. Uh, you want to know what else is for real? The support that you can give us at patreon.com slash weird things. Head on over there right now. Get your custom RSS feed, put it into the podcatcher of your choice and get the after things podcast where we talk about uh, being an entrepreneur, uh, making things happen. It's all there for your friends. Patreon.com slash weird things. So kind of cool news. Uh, I think it's cool coming out of San Diego Zoo is they took cells from a 40-year-old deep freeze uh, of a horse, uh, an endangered horse, Prince Walski's horse, which I guess has gone extinct in the wild, and they're actually able to clone it. Wow. Is this the first uh, cloning to bring back a extinct species? I, I know I, I, I'm certain that I've heard stories. Maybe I'm making this up. Uh, I believe I've heard about a species that had gone extinct and they had frozen eggs that they were able to finally cook and make them come back. But, but is... Well, again, it's, it's an endangered, so not extinct, but Sorry. Uh, Sorry. I yeah. don't, I, I, you know, it depends probably what we categorize. Cause probably like, you know, we've probably revitalized cells or things like this on a like microorganism level on a larger level. I don't know, but this is this funky looking kind of cool horse that basically I think they put it into, you know, uh, you know, use a regular, you know, you know, horse to help, you know, carry it. But uh, yeah, uh, 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 even even if it's a, a different breed, uh, an animal can gestate somebody close enough to them as long as it doesn't trigger like that uh, rejection response. In fact, yeah. um, uh, 20 years ago, I remember some discovery special suggesting that uh, you would uh, to bring back the woolly mammoth, you would kind of hybridize it with a with a, uh, an elephant and increasingly select for more woolly mammoth traits and then eventually like, yeah, that's pretty much a wool woolly mammoth. Yeah. Uh, and this one. Yeah. The idea is to. Yeah. This one's a full clone. But like as Brian's saying, if you want to get to something that's a little bit di genetically different, you might, you know, create your hybrid first and then from there clone you know, have that carry the clone. So it's, it's been a minute since I've paid attention to the methods of cloning. The way I remember is that they, uh, Dolly the sheep, uh, what, 25 years ago, they, they took, uh, if I remember correctly, the nucleus containing the DNA of an adult cell and put it in an embryo cell. And you get a lot of whoopsie doodles on that. You get a lot of uh, 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 critters that are, that are born uh, uh, with, with all kinds of genetic difficulties. Uh, but of those that, are uh, genetically viable, their offspring tend to be sort of like threaded stock that are, that are safe. I remember there was a Wired article that I read of, of several years back with the headline, you have almost certainly eaten cloned meat. And mm -hmm. it, talked, it talked about how in the, cow in the cattle trade, basically they would, they would clone uh, a good, really, really good beef stock and then uh, uh, the clones themselves were kind of a mixed bag, but any that could reproduce were, uh, were okay to eat. Yeah, there's, there's a, one of the problems that we encountered was that for some animals, there's a lot of information that's on, we, there's a thing called uh, methylation, which is there's DNA and on the surface of the DNA, you actually have these like little protein sequences that can carry extra data, which is just sort of like like kind of an addendum, you know, it's like kind of a, a, a like a, a patch, so to speak. And that was one of the problems that they realized, like when they first, some of the cloning was like the DNA was right, but we didn't copy, we didn't know how to copy, like we still don't know how to copy methylation. And that's been the limiting on some animals because there's a lot more data on like the methylation, which and, controls the growth of things like muscles and stuff. Um, well, in, uh, okay. Uh, I just realized how far over my head we've, I've gotten myself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I'm going to say good, good on that horse for, for having more yeah. babies. Kurt the horse. His name is Kurt. <laughs> what yeah. a stud. What a stud. The Wikipedia definition for our word of the day is methylation. So DNA methylation is a biological process by which methyl groups are added to the DNA molecule. Methylation can change the activity of the DNA segment without changing the sequence. When located in a gene promoter, DNA methylation typically acts to repress gene transcription. So that's remember when you saw like the super like muscular like cow or something like that. Oh with, like, yeah, double... yeah, yeah, it looked like 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 a like a Mister Universe of a cow. Yeah, and that probably was like, if I remember was like a case of like methylation. They didn't have the thing to say, yeah, stop growing muscles at this point. Like, dude, you're buff. You look great. You're great. Yeah. So it's tricky, but there are ways. 
one of the ways that you we might be able to do now is that we have we've discovered like optical properties like negative index of refraction which actually means be able to like you can basically image things like on a molecule sort of size so you might be able to take the dna from an organism look at the surface of it see what the methylation is and then when you copy it be able to maybe at some point be able to copy the methylation to or basically add it to the surface or do something to that effect wow that's insane so uh and of course tally sorrell <laughs> <laughs> the smart contingent here is telling us it is, like it yeah, is they, a little bit it, it, it's a little bit intimidating for us to do our horse apples uh pseudoscience the paranormal the fringes of science show in front of a, a literal brain scientists who are geniuses yeah uh so she asked am i talking atomic force microscopy or total internal reflection this would be a, was would, would probably be uh the the latter not the former this is a this was just a theoretical thing like eight years ago. Like, I don't even know if it's in the lab yet, but it was one of the, you know, I had a, a friend that was working at one of the Gates Institute grants and I was talking about this sort of thing. Like, oh yeah, we just, you know, cause it was just, there was a paper that came out like a couple of months before. I'm like, ah, oh, have you looked at this? Can you do it for this? Like, yeah, we're looking into that. Cool. But I don't know. I haven't followed up to know where that is, but it's just to show you that things we thought we couldn't image, we might be able to. And that's cross disciplines. Great is sometimes somebody goes, yeah, can't solve this. And then, you know, it was my, my crazy favorite example is like DSL is works because we figure like, ah, oh, it's too noisy. Well, we can send a signal through and measure how noisy the signal is and then take that away. Cool. Oh, we can't see through these, this atmospheric laser, this atmospheric layer to go look at like stars. Well, we can do a thing like DSL where we shoot a laser and see how it distorts and subtract it helps to an extent, but just... Uh, 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 you just reminded me of, I, I, I believe it was over the last week, there was some article headline that I read that uh, Beetlejuice is not nearly as far away as we thought, and not nearly as big as we thought, and not nearly yeah. as close to exploding as we hoped, because we all wanted to see a cool, rad-ass supernova in our lifetimes, and it looks like um, it may be 100,000 years till, till that happens. Yeah, that's the crazy thing is we've talked briefly about this before about how we don't we are starting we're realizing some stars are like orders like 20% closer than we thought they were before because our ways of measuring things by magnitude, etc. is imprecise. Yeah, I don't know how to feel about it. I guess I guess fine. Uh, it's good to have Beetlejuice around. It's one of the, it's one of the, the 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 stars of the show, so to speak, in the winter night sky. But but that was always my favorite part of giving a sky tour was mentioning that Beetlejuice was thought to potentially go supernova in our you know, like 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 it's cooked and ready to start popping like a like a popcorn. But uh, but apparently that's not the case. It's farther. It's closer and smaller. Well. Cool. <laughs> and, and by the way, whether it's at the old thought to be distance or the new confirmed distance, even if it goes supernova, that's that's not going to be a problem for us. It'll just be a cool show. I just imagine Brian late at night in bed, Bonnie, like, what's the matter? It's Beetlejuice. I just can't. I'm worried. I'm worried about the star. <laughs> She's like, Brian, your Beetlejuice is fine. It's fine. It doesn't have to be that big or that far away. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> You guys want to do picks? Yeah, man. Uh, sure. Justin and I talked about this a little bit last week on Happy Hour, but I, I finally subscribed to HBO Max because I already had it for free and didn't know it. Uh, because uh, 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 pro tip, if you have AT&T for any of your uh, internet provider uh, stuff, you have HBO Max for free because AT&T owns HBO. Uh, but, uh, but, but once I got in there, and as Justin put it, I, after pillaging city after city of content having COVID, I finally have a new city to ransack. And so I watched the movie uh, Class Action Park, the documentary about Action Park up in uh, Vernon, New Jersey. Uh, man, it was, I, I'm really curious what it looks like to people who had never been to Action Park. I spent one day there when I was teaching uh, magic at a camp up in upstate New York, and that was the big trip. I did fully two thirds of everything they mentioned on the show. I was like, I gotta remember that. I was there, I did that one. I saw that one, I was scared of that one. And uh, yes, that's exactly how it was. Uh, weirdly, no exaggeration. Everything they said of like, yep, that's exactly what 
Action Park was like, and that's exactly how I remember it. I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I, I, I would be curious, though, what it looks like to somebody who, uh, who has not been there. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I only saw commercials for it, but, but it, it certainly is, especially for people that grew up in the Northeast, a, a just a cultural touchstone. Like they, uh, uh, everybody of a certain age remembers Action Park. Uh, my pick is a book called The Big Picture. Uh, it came out two years ago, but it is a narrative based around the Sony hacks. So uh, the, the author attempts to kind of tell the big story of how Hollywood has morphed over the past uh, 20 years with uh, the like totally unprecedented x-ray into a studio that has not caught up with the big franchises uh, and was attempting to do so in Sony. Uh, so far, it's pretty good. I'm listening to the audiobook. There's a little bit of filler on it, and it includes one of my favorite things. If you're a voracious audiobook reader, then you will understand that there are these certain moments where the readers of the audiobook, pleasant, amazing voices and great performers that they are, oftentimes either them or the editor understand the little, little, little eccentricities that make a story what it is. Two of my favorite Hall of Fame examples are in a book about ESPN. They're talking about the legendary Sports Center jingle, which ends da 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 da. Uh, and in reading the audiobook, the guy just had no clue how to do it and obviously had never heard the sports center jingle. So we just go, na 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 na. Na 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 na. Uh, there was also another one about the military that didn't understand the, I believe it's the, the Marine greeting of hoo ha. Ah! Like, and so it was just like as they gave their traditional hoo ha greeting. Uh, and similarly in this book, there is just constant reference to the studio Warner Bros. Okay, I was about to ask you about that because because yeah. I'm like I've never read that and heard in my mind anything other than Warner Brothers abbreviated forever but forever he... written as Warner Brothers. I have never heard Warner Bros said out loud. <laughs> uh, but it, it it's just one of those things that it just seems like oh I get it. If I had never really cared about this stuff and it's you read what's on the page and it's always written as Warner B R O S period right. But it's always referred to as either WB or Warner Brothers. Uh, so yeah, it, it so far so good. It, it uh, I'm at what uh, was was described to me as the reason why the book is special, and that is kind of uh, the the development of After Earth, the Will Smith vehicle, and what they expected it to be, and the decline of star power in general in Hollywood in favor of uh, franchises and content, but uh, uh, so far so good. In the audiobook version, uh, cause I'm also listening to it. He does one of my favorite things, which normally you only hear the author of the book kind of editorialize or give anything other than the written words on the page. And when you do, it's awesome. Like I remember Arnold Schwarzenegger does this. Or I, I know Adam Carolla does this. I know that Kevin Smith did it in his book. It's where they get to a part of the book where something is written and then they just break character and they describe it. And so in the Arnold Schwarzenegger version, he's reading everything and then he goes like, all right, so at this part, it is a big legal document and that it, it, uh, uh, it says stuff like this. And, but if you read down the line, it says F U C K. And then it is, it's very funny. It's very, anyway, and then it goes back to, to reading. Uh, but, but this book, it's just an audiobook reader. It's not the author, but he sort of adds some, shuffing laughter here and again where it's like he'll say a sentence and go huh. <laughs> like, 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 yeah. and I'm just like who gave him that direction it's really weird uh but yeah no a uh, uh, good uh, uh good story and also it's a good primer on um Marvel because Marvel and Netflix are kind of like the ascendant powers as they are discussing uh Sony 
and some of the other uh, uh, studios, but uh, uh, you know, uh, Marvel and, and, and the fight between exactly how they went into their own movie business, how they sold to Disney is, uh, is it, it cool and interesting. Uh, they, they also, the same thing that is a problem in the part that, that you're reading right now, kind of the death of the mid-level star vehicle, uh, yeah. uh, they, they, they reverse when they talk about how Netflix saved mid-level, mid-budget movies, and then also how uh, Amazon went out of their way to own, you know, the indie art house experience, even though it's in every way the exact opposite of the place that you buy toilet paper from. Yeah. Uh, no, it's uh, good stuff. Uh, I got a pick. I uh, just started playing a new video game, uh, and it's a it's a sci-fi game, and uh, I think it's really interesting. You know, the things that I really am drawn to with sci-fi stuff, I I do like time travel stories and stories about um, you know multiple timelines. And <laughs> this game that I found uh, just over this past weekend uh, has all of that <laughs> and much much more. Um, it's from uh, Atlas and Vanillaware. Uh, Vanillaware known for making these really beautiful, uh, almost looking like they're hand painted uh, uh, graphics. It's called Thirteen Sentinels Aegis Rim. Um, it is a mixture of like a top down real time strategy game and also these hand painted narrative scenes that you are interacting with and making decisions with. Uh, it it's really interesting. I'm like six or seven hours into it, um, and I think that's about a quarter of the way through. Um, I think it's really interesting in that it has a lot of main characters, um, and also it has a very clear delineation between all of this action strategy stuff that you're doing and all of the narrative stuff. And I haven't figured out. I haven't played enough of the narrative to know why why these two things are so so separate, right? You would think like, okay, well, in a game like this, you would do stuff and then you would fight and do stuff and you'd kind of go back and forth like this where here this is completely up almost completely up to the player of how much you want to do of any one thing at any one time uh and i think it's fascinating there's a lot of uh, uh you know time travel and ufos and kaiju are uh, the the big enemy force uh it's i don't want to talk too much about the specifics of it because I don't know how much of it is a spoiler and how much of it, how much of it is just the stuff that they tell you in the first few hours of the game. Um, but I, I think it's really, really interesting and does a good job of making the story stuff feel a little interactive so you're not just reading and or having all the stuff read to you and making the gameplay stuff feel, um, feel really accessible. Like, I don't play a lot of real-time strategy games and this feels very, very approachable. So... Um, I don't know it's on it's on the PS4 now. Thirteen Sentinels, Aegis Rim. Right on, cool, cool. Andrew, I'm gonna double down on the book Astoria again. It's a, a great sort of story about exploration and what could have been. It would be a wonderful source for a alt history sort of thing. This is right at the founding of America. The idea of trying to create this other to basically Astoria is like Astoria, Oregon, which was going to be the capital of this other country and you know, had the blessing of like, uh, I think Jefferson, et cetera, to go off and try to do this thing. And it just ran into, uh, there are just a couple things that sort of fell apart. Had they not, American history could have been radically different. You know, I mean, literally a, a canoe's worth of supplies or things like this could have had a huge impact. Um, so I just really loved the book. And a great example too, like the more we go back and read about what it was like in 1800, 1810s, 1820s, things like this, it's helpful. And and also, like, you know, we talk about today, you know, ah, politics, it's horrible. How many people got shot in duels in front of the, <laughs> you know, the Capitol building? Like, it yeah. hasn't happened in months, as far as I know. So. I, I, I do have that moment when people talk about this is an unprecedented era in political history in America. Never have we been more divided. I'm like, I can think of one time we were a little bit more divided. <laughs> a little bit more divided. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. even even at the Capitol structure, it's like, yeah, I... Like, oh, I can't believe they said this on Twitter or they said this back. I'm like, yeah, you know, 200 years ago, they'd be out with guns shooting at each other. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. And we'd be cool. They'd be like, yeah, a little bit, really, guys. Uh, but that, you got to do what you got to do. You know, the trusty duel. <laughs> so how how much of this Astoria book is um, uh, not fictionalized? N narrative? But, yeah. How much of it is like, zhuzhed up or is this more really a historical document 
really historical, very, okay. very historical. This group went through there, and from letters from there, we know this. So and so had said this later on. So it's not a, you know, and he thought to himself, you know, <laughs> as he died alone in his cabin with nobody to remember his thoughts ever. It's not that. It is very much pulling up because a lot of letters, a lot of stuff back and forth. So uh very I, I enjoyed it. And it's just a really good reminder of like as you fly, you know, as you fly from the East Coast to the West Coast or vice versa. You know, as you, you know, you're thrown in the sky, as it's called, you just, you know, like a god. And you think like, uh, you know, just a couple of generations ago, very different. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Cool. It's been weird. All right, good stuff. I got to use the bathroom. All right, take a break, everybody. All right. Uh, I got a hard out right before one. Yeah, uh, okay. I was about to ask if we can make it quick as well, because I got three earthquakes that are happening, and and the, 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 three o'clock our time. So so you and I are in the same boat. Okay. They schedule those now? <laughs> earthquakes, yeah. Cool, we'll keep it. In, in, uh... in the form of, of, of closing documents for rejiggering oh. mortgages and whatnot. I see. Uh, cool. Well, we can, uh, we'll keep it a little trim. Uh, and I did... See uh, we Andrew, I sent you an after things question, which I think will be good and probably quick. Super. Uh, uh, how was your How was your weekend? Do you watch anything cool uh, other than Class Action Park? Should I watch Class Action Action Park if Action Park is not a thing in my milieu? I Brian? I do think um, it is a bonkers enough story that yeah. that you will hear like like uh, a, as a good documentary does you have people who are describing a thing and then you have footage of the thing so you're going to hear if you just heard all of the people describing the thing you would say to yourself there's no way it was really like that but then they cut to the video of it and you're like oh it was <laughs> definitely like that uh the uh, the story that i told justin is they had this one water slide because the dude who opened it would just have ideas and then just try them he uh they had this one water slide where you went so fast that it, you went into a tube and it did a loop-de-loop -loop in the water slide <gasps> oh, and so he built it no. and then he just started waving hundred dollar bills to the staff and say i'll give a hundred dollars to anyone who can who tries it and if people were coming out with like busted clavicles and all beat the hell up and then they're like okay we need more padding so they put more padding, padding. In, and then people started coming out with lacerations all over their body <laughs> so the they fabric. they opened it up and they found out that the lacerations were coming from the missing teeth that were embedded in the padding <gasps> that was slicing them up while bodies were going through the thing. <laughs> Human teeth? Yes. Oh my yes. god! It's bonkers. It's it's uh, so so yeah. It might be worth taking a look. Okay, I'm gonna check that out. Wow. Because <laughs> that's kind of the basis for that that jackass movie that they did. Uh, did they already do it? I thought that was coming out. Or, Maybe it, it no, 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 no. It's already it's already out. Okay. It was not not uh, sorry not a new jackass, but. But, but Jack Johnny Knox Johnny vehicle. On TV. Yeah, because yeah. I think that I met was the like director action. at a. Oh, go ahead. I met the director at a party once before he was coming. I'm like, what are you working on? I'm like, oh, have you heard of this thing called Action Park? I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. They hired me to do a movie on that. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, it was kind of like they hired me to do a movie on it. <laughs> uh, Brian, did you need a minute? Or no, no, I'm good. Go? Okay, well then, uh, uh, and you heard me mention that email, Andrew. I don't know if you've got yeah, a chance yep. to read that. If you want to do that, yes. Okay, cool. Then I'll catch you in here for after things in three, two. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello. Justin Robert Young. Hello. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hello, everybody. Hey, we're going to jump right into a question. It's a great one. And this is from Terry Robinson. Terry writes, I write RPG supplements for a game line that is a community content portal where people can make and sell licensed works from the IP owner. I generally price my works either as free or pay what you want as my goal is to just get play aids and plot ideas into players' hands and I have a good day job. Other writers have asked me not to give away my stuff as they say I'm cheapening their product. Are they making a reasonable argument? What do I owe to my fellow creators if my goal is to have a healthy community? Hmm. Uh, good question. So, so man, that, that is kind of a tough spot in that... Um... Uh, once, once you have a commons, uh, and, uh, 
Then, it, then all of a sudden, your behavior affects other people. And and I guess I guess uh, both you and I, Andrew, have dealt with this in the magic community, and that there's a commons of shared uh, methods, uh, general methods for deception, specific methods for deception. There's lineage of uh, who created what uh, idea and subtlety that goes on. And so. Uh, they, uh, on the one hand, everybody wants lots of new ideas in the magic community, but on the other hand, uh, if you just allow everyone going willy-nilly, then it might be that, that many people start ripping off other people. So, so you want to try to keep everybody happy. So certainly um, listen to other folks who feel like you're reducing the value of their work. But what I've found is that if their complaint is not directly tied to dollars, but instead you can take another form of payment, for example, uh, for example, oh, well, it's technically free, but in order to get it, you have to sign up for my list or do this thing or join this clubhouse or whatever. Then all of a sudden it's not free in that you have to exchange labor to do it, which should satisfy other folks because there's no way to directly compare the action of joining your community and your clubhouse to the dollar value associated with it. And if there is any question about it, you could, you know, you could just kick it back saying, oh no, normally it's a thousand dollars to join my community. So if anything, I'm raising the price or whatever. But, but on the other hand, um, if, if you don't need the money, then there, there's no reason that you need, I guess what I'm saying is there's no reason that you need to rely on currency being the only way to, make sure that your product has value. There, there are many currencies out there. There's effort, there's enthusiasm, there's participation, there's uh, actions on, on the part of other people. And you, you can allay the fears of people who are afraid that nobody's gonna pay $10 for my uh, expansion pack if you're giving it for free, then your answer should be, it's not free. You have to do blank, 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 and blank. And personally, I'd rather pay $5, $10 than do that. I'll give a different take, and that is I live in a world as a writer where anybody can call themselves a writer. Anybody can write a book, put a book up on Amazon, make a book available for free, put something out there. Anybody can do that, okay? And I am in constant competition with all of the free content out there. And even in my own genre, mystery, thriller, whatever, there are people who are tons of free content out there. I call myself a professional because I can compete with all the amateurs. I can compete with the people who do it for fun. And I think that I, I have the, I'm afforded because I'm a pro to have enough time to make sure my stuff is, and there are great amateurs out there, let me be very clear. But for the most part, because I'm a pro, which means I spend, my job is to write good books. My job is to make sure my material is better than the amateur. If this person tells me, hey, I can do a nine to five job, and then on my my spare time for fun, I can go create stuff that's high quality and people want this. And the people who are trying to do it for a living say, no, that's not right. I'm like, well, maybe the quality, the problem isn't this person. Maybe the problem is their quality. Why are you trying to do this for money if somebody who can do it for free and for fun is doing as good of a job as you? Maybe your quality, maybe their quality needs to be better. Maybe they need to be offering more to people because if it's that easy to create good content, I don't think I, I I think I think you're 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 creating this. You have permission to use this medium. You're not taking anything from anybody. We face this in magic a lot where people are like, oh, this person prices so cheaply. Like if you're if if somebody wants to go charge a hundred dollars to go do a birthday party and that's gonna impact your business, you're in the wrong part of the business. You know, you need to be in a different part of it. And I would hear this all the time, like, oh, the amateurs, they cheapen, and the people who I think complain the most didn't weren't that pro they were called themselves pros but their product wasn't differentiated enough i'm like yeah if somebody can go to the magic shop on a saturday buy five tricks practice them and go out and go do it do birthday parties a month later and have customers be as happy with their show as they were with your show the problem isn't them yeah uh and 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 i i think that there there comes down to this idea of uh protecting a a a, a role that may or may not fully exist. And, and a lot of times what I think inter community frustration is, is just manifested disappointment and people being upset with how their experience is going and looking to project and find reasons as to why. And so you would say, okay, well, why aren't my things selling? 
well, because you got these people out here giving it away for free. That's why. And it's like, well, okay, if, if you can't compete with that, then, then you do have a problem. The one thing I will say, though, is beyond the the complaining, I do think that there there is something to be said for understanding where uh, where there is a market, right? So if 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 let's look at this email in a slightly different perspective and and not focus on what I think we all agree is sour grapes from people that are charging more, if there is a community for which there is uh, it's worthwhile to pay money to do it and you feel like that is something that you could charge a little money for. I think that part of that might be a, a sign to say, well, look, if, if maybe you should charge a little bit for, for your handiwork. And, and it's worth pointing out that in terms of overall satisfaction with the prod product, there, there are studies that indicate people feel more satisfied and like certain things more when they've paid for it. Like, like they, they, they get a deeper sense of satisfaction for it. I don't know if that's the case for this one thing or not, but, uh, but it, it, it does matter uh, psychologically that, that, that endowment effect, they call it, uh, where, where it's like when, when you've given something up and you own a thing, then you value it more. I, and I think that's, I, I agree too, but I'd also say another factor is like, I, one of the reasons I wanted to work with Amazon and I was excited too, is because I know as a publisher, they embraced the Kindle unlimited program, which plug, 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 but meant that people could pay like, you know, it was like 10 bucks a month or something and get unlimited amount of books to read. And there are a lot of people that like to read a lot of books, but they don't have a lot of disposable income to buy every book they want. And they subscribe to this program, you know, because with that, you have access to hundreds of thousands of books, right? And for me, I want readers. I don't want money. I like, I like money. Let me make that very clear. Andrew likes money. Fact. Andrew also does not like barriers between people who want my material and my material. I don't, doesn't mean I want other people to distribute it for me freely. <laughs> I like to be able to control that aspect of distribution. But if I can find a system where it gets people to it, because I don't, you know, when somebody says, Hey, I want to, I'm saving up to buy your book next month, or I want to do this, whatever. I feel flattered and saddened that, that there is that barrier between having this thing. And so there's a lot of people out there that like to play games, like to play expansions. There are a lot of people, a lot of spare time right now who are still struggling and whatever and providing things, making things freely available and pay as you can, you're helping people. And if you're asking me like the amount of hours of joy, you're probably bringing people who may not otherwise be able to afford this material that's the sick. That's the only signal that I think you need because you're not taking anything. You're not stealing a thing from anybody. There are people who say, no, I don't like the way this is effect on the market. That's different, but it's your materials, not theirs. Yeah. I, I think we're all in agreement that there's no merit to the claim that you producing your content for free is materially taking anything away from anyone else. And if they say that, uh, per a Andrew and Justin's comments, then they are incorrect. I, I suppose I'm uh, the, the only way my answer differed is having said that, that doesn't make them any less a pain in your butt by loudly complaining about it constantly and a tactical way to get them to calm down might be to point to something besides money that you're, that you're, that you're requiring in order to get it. And I, I will also say that I don't know what that community is like. I know that communities are often defined by, you know, the blogs and message boards for which everybody pays attention and that there are micro battles that exist within it. That certainly is true in magic. And sometimes it is just better to make peace with people than to necessarily fight your, your holy war. But in general, if you're looking for other people to say that this is fine for you to do this, it's fine for you to do it. Yeah, I had I had writers who criticized me when I started because I gave away my books for free. I got criticism. People looked down on me because I gave my stuff away for free. And I'm like, I want an audience. Like, well, you know, people if people find value, they'll pay for it. I'm like, they got to know who the hell I am. And they don't know who I am. And if, if the way to get people to know who I am is to give my stuff away for free or to make it cheap, then I'm going to do that because I could play that other game and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And the people who told me I did it wrong now, I'm like, not to be you know, snide, but it's like, how did your path work out for you? Yeah. And I would say from a tactical Stephen perspective, King. <laughs> I would <laughs> say from a tactical perspective, the shortest path to everybody being happy almost universally is getting on the phone with them. If somebody really has a beef with you, give it away for free, just say, Oh my gosh, 
I'm so bummed. Or, 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 or don't even say you're bummed. Just say, just say, wow, this sounds important. We should get on a call. When, when is good? And then the moment you speak in person, uh, it's, it's astonishing how quickly phone calls turn into collaborative ventures where it's like, what's important to you? Where, oh, okay, great. Uh, uh, and then organically, it seems like so often you end up talking about win-win solutions. So whenever you can speak to the human being. Yeah, absolutely. That helps. And, and sometimes it's going to be an attitude. It's hard because you, you, they might be dealing with financial hardships and stuff and looking for somebody to blame. And you can certainly do things to help boost other people to be, you know, how do you, uh, it, while I had my model, I did things to promote other authors, to celebrate other stuff. And even though people could say, ah, he's a jerk, none of my outward behavior looked like a jerk. You know, I was supportive, encouraging of other people and always have been that way. And I'm like, this is my model. You can question this, but don't think that I don't like people. I'm trying to be helpful. Yeah. So again, it's, yeah, it's, we don't, who knows what that community is really like, but uh, yeah, the two questions are, are you doing the right thing? Yeah. If you want to get along their community, like yeah, Brian says, figure out that balance. But well, and, and, and it's yeah. worth, it's worth sort of pausing to say, okay, at what cost, at what cost do I want to be beloved by the members of this community? And, and, and what do I get out of that? And maybe it could be that you do the calculus and you're like, yeah, there's literally nothing there for me and uh, I'm just going to do my own thing. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Let's uh, wrap this up. We've got a, uh... Running out of internet here. Turns out there's a finite <laughs> internet to it. Uh, quick question. Somebody just asked about Kindle Unlimited. How, do, how does the author get paid? What they do is every month, Amazon has a big chunk of money, like $20 million. And then they take the total number of pages and they divide that up. So each author gets paid per page read based out of that. So, so it's similar to the way YouTube Premium works, where essentially it's, it's uh, viewer minutes. But yeah, pages. exactly. Yeah, and th there was all sorts of people kind of gaming it early on by having like click here and it took them to the end of the book. Oh, geez. You know, and, and just oh, all geez. sorts of stuff. But but I've been, even the major publishers, a lot of them put books there. I use, I've been very happy with it because it's another way to capture an audience. Very cool. Cool. Gentlemen, it's been after. Cool. Yeah. All righty. Well, that'll do it for Weird Things and After Things today. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, Brian and Justin will be back for happy hour. Yeah, we'll be back in, in an hour. Uh, an in Andrew, that. if it's okay, I'll call you just just for like three minutes before, uh, as soon as we're off. Is that doable? Yeah, I, I have in five minutes, I have a, a conference. Okay, so why don't you two go, go do that right now right, and you we'll okay. shut everything down. Bye. Uh, All right. Why are you holding uh, us up first? Bye. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. I hope you. And then Cord Killers coming up in a few hours. Justin, Justin R. Young on Twitch. Yeah. And Andrew Main on yeah. Twitter. All right, everybody. Bye. Bye. bye.